Hello and welcome to our channel, Marstream, your public performance broadcast platform. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. You can also donate to our tip jar and support the arts and artists in Marstream by clicking the link below in the description. Check out our website at themarsh.org for all upcoming live performances. Now enjoy the show. I'm so pleased to have Ron Jones. He's a storyteller, a performer, a playwright, progenitor of the 1968 Palo Alto Wave Experience, experiment and experience. Three of his books, The Acorn People, Bee Ball and the Wave, have been made into TV specials, garnering an Emmy, Peabody, and Golden Globe Awards for its producers. Jones's book, Say Ray, was also honored as American Book of the Year and nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. So let's welcome Mr. Ron Jones, Martian extraordinaire. Hi, Ron. Hi, Stephanie. How are you? I'm pretty good. And yourself? I am good. So tonight you're going to do a number of different things, right? Yeah, yeah. Your first one is about your granddaughter, Brianna. You want to talk a little bit about Brianna? Sure. Well, Brianna is over my shoulder here. Brianna is my oldest granddaughter. And I thought this evening would be dedicated to uh, stories about growing up in San Francisco. I mean, I have grown up on 46th Avenue. My parents, aunts and uncles, grandparents, we all lived on the same avenue. My mother, being Jewish, wanted us to live in one big house. But this sufficed, one long avenue. My uncle was a union organizer for the postal workers, and my grandfather ran a burlesque house in North Beach. So as a young kid, I got to hang out at, at President Foley's. And I think that leads to some of the stories I'm going to be telling you. There's a, a musicality, hopefully, and, and, a, and, and a joy. So, so you said, do you think when you're Jewish, you want to have everybody in the same house? Did you just refer to that? Well, that's really true. My, my parents took in everybody, uh, musicians sleeping on the couch. My dad was a trombone player. My mom was a dancer. But we also took in one family, um, Glenna, who was a dancer who had been abused, and her two children, Sandy and Jean, and they have lived with us for a, a lifetime. My grandparents took in a World War II vet that was shell-shocked and lived in the Naughty Pine Room. And then we took in two kids, thanks to my daughter, Hillary, who brought home two kids. Uh, and now she's taking care of people. I, I don't know if it's a Jewish trait or it's just something we, the benefit of us being with others. And I want to know how many separate houses on that avenue were made, were filled with your family members? Three. Ours, 46th Avenue in Kirkham. For you, I thought it was... I had the address wrong for my entire lifetime, but down the avenue was my aunt and uncle and further down the avenue, my grandparents lived. And were your parents also born in San Francisco? Uh, my mother was born in San Francisco. She went to Mission High School. She was a dancer. She tells stories of dancing at the Wigwam and all these different theaters that used to have live entertainment. They both were fortunate to live in the era of vaudeville. So even the Fox Theater had a pit orchestra and, and dancers. Uh, both my parents enjoy that era of life, which the music represents to me. And was your dad a musician? Remind me. Yeah, he was a trombone player. He, he was really unusual. My mother, being Jewish, wanted to put curtains on the world and make it a better place for everyone. My father, being Catholic, felt that everything was just perfect. You just go to church and do a little confession, and then you're free. He was the most unusual person. Every meal was perfect. He would be driving along and he'd stop the car, step outside and practice his horn to a sunset. He was just, he just enjoyed life. He sold TVs on Market Street at Sterling Furniture to make a living. But I enjoyed his life as a musician. I, I would go to Sweet's Ballroom with him in Oakland and I would sit behind the trombone sections and, and watch these hundreds of dancers swirl in front of me and the sailors jitterbugging off to one side. But just to be around music, it's, it's a gift. I wish I could play. I, I'm talking on the chill chat to one of my nephews saying, um, he's a trombone player. I was saying, hey baby, get out there and improvise. <laughs> How did your parents meet? 
probably, it's hard to say exactly, uh, they both participated in the 1939 World's Fair. My mother was one of the naked dancers and my dad was a trombone player. So that's possibly where they, they met. They were naked at the World's Fair? There yeah, were there was a famous group called Cowgirls. I think they were slightly dressed, but it was definitely a, what they call a come on. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but my mom, my mom, <laughs> my mom also, she was one of the ladies at the, if you ever went to the, what was the name of that place, 365 Bimbo, there was a naked lady in the fishbowl. Oh, she was one of the naked ladies. It, it, it was down in the basement of the building and they, they had mirrors and they reflected this woman up to this fishbowl. It was pretty famous at the time. But she was a singer. And I'm, I'm going to tell some stories about her because I think my life was blessed by this woman that that solved every problem by singing. I mean, every problem. <laughs> I am, and I'm a terrible singer. <laughs> I'm dumbstruck by that thought to solve every problem by singing, but we can get there. We will. So now we're talking about your parents and you did just celebrate your 58th anniversary. How did you meet Deanna? We met in high school. We both went to Lincoln High School. Um, and uh, she's so cute. You know, she still is to me. <laughs> and she's, she's a beautiful woman. I, I'm, I'm writing her a love letter as our anniversary gift. And it's really an attempt to chronicle all the crazy things we've done through our lives. Just so we can have this memory and pass on that memory to uh, this child here and other children, Taylor, and our daughter, Hillary and Digger. So, that's what we're working on. You know, maybe that's the next time you'll come on. You'll maybe you'll sing us that 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 piece you wrote for Hillary, not Hillary, Deanna. Yeah, maybe. maybe that'd be fun to do. I'll have to work on. It. it has to be condensed. Right now, it's 153 pages, a single space yellow tablet. Probably not perfect for a performance. <laughs> <laughs> maybe an all day, all night thing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's that's great. So, so let's do let's do Brianna. That will give you yeah. a clue as to um, a, a relationship in growing up in the sunset. Again, this is um, one of my granddaughters. Uh, they're both really unique. Taylor is really fun, but this is Brianna and our relationship. Driving down the street, terrible tea. Me and my baby, baby. She's only three. Singing along with the willow bees, my bubbles, hey, baby, boo. She likes to tease, honey, then to please. I'm so happy. Mm -mm. Look, 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 there's a bee, bubbles, bee bank, a bakery, bumpity, bump, bump, bump. She comes in the morning, whispers to me, wake up, puppy, hey, look at me. I'm a princess, Lion King, Batman, silly, dancing and giggling. Mm -hmm. Can you find me? She's always hiding in the very same place. She hides under the bed, just a wig, wig, wiggling in place. I stomp through the house, boom, 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 boom. Where can she be? Hey, I see you, bree, 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 dee, dee. Hey, now, girl, why don't you try to find some other place to hide? Do you realize that you were always hiding in the very same place? Well, I know Poppy likes to hide in the tub. It's my very same place. Wasn't always, always this way. This breedle deedle dee wasn't wanted by me. But her mother, my daughter, she was so strong. Bled on the floor, this baby was born. Brianna Marie, we called her Bree Bree. Father's black, sitting in jail. Mother's so young, learning to fail. Long comes this child, black and white. What to be, what is right. Innocent eyes, mm-hmm, just looking at me. Nappy hair, braided so tight, soft melon lips, kiss me goodnight, face that shines, always so bright. She doesn't know she'll have to fight just to be different, mm -hmm. just to be free. Remember your grandma, Pape, too, tangles in the kitchen, making a sandwich or two you can squeeze in. Get between us, that's right. We're just hugging honey into the night. Telling me true, she's a big girl now. She can find bees and Bernasa Cerise. She makes dirt soup and serves it to me. Every day we have this tea. Come on, Poppy, sit with me. 
asking questions, answering them to what, where, why, who, growing so fast she can find bees. Soon we will part this baby and me. She to a future mm -hmm. I'll never see. Baba say, yeah, boo -boo. But for this moment, for so many moments, Brianna Marie, I'm thinking of you. So that's Brianna. <laughs> that's Brianna. How old is she now? Uh, she is very old. A matter of fact, here's a picture of her. Can you see that? Oh, yeah. So that's Brianna right there. That's and this is the best news of all. This is why I'm telling this story tonight, because she's probably watching, hopefully, down in Texas. Can you see this picture? Yes. And is that what she's is pregnant. that thing? She's pregnant. This means that Deanna and I are going to be not great grandparents, but really great grandparents. We've always been great. But now it's official. <laughs> oh, we're excited. We talk about the pandemic. We cannot wait to get down there. Wow. And our daughter is panicking. Hillary's has to be with her daughter. It's it's so wonderful to witness. <laughs> <laughs> How wonderful. Yeah. And Ron, you sing just fine. There was nothing terrible about your singing. Did oh. your parents tell you you were a bad singer and you haven't gotten over it? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> They, they did. They no, did. the truth is I played trumpet too. So my dad's a trombone player and, and you know, gives me a trumpet. And you think I would become a great trumpet player. Cannot improvise. It's, that's a gift that some people have. I wish I had that. And singers, I think great singers have that improvised quality, I, which it's fun to find. I'm trying to find it trying to find it in my mouth. Like my, my, my mom tap danced with the Nicholas brothers. So I'm trying to do like, you're, you're gonna hear that in birds. It's, it's an attempt to recall that tap dancing, singing improvisation in writing too, in writing too. Well, you know, so it made me think a lot when I was listening to you, like what you are an, a, a vocal word improviser. You may not have been able to do it on the trombone, but you do it constantly when you're writing and you're making art, correct? You know, that is becoming something. I've taken Charlie Barron and David Ford's class in club solo, and through all those years, there is a gradual sense that to, to find that unique voice, to not be afraid. You know, normally a writer is right in linear fashion, trying to put things together but it's to deconstruct them and to find ways of entering and leaving and, and, and embossing. That is the secret. And I'm finally, at, at the age of 80, I'm finally welcoming that improvisation. So what are your, what are your, you know, like, what are your, what you call it? The people that, your inspirations for that? Because, you know, Lawrence Ferlinghetti died yesterday. Oh my, yes. Oh, it's all that stuff. Do you think you are inspired by the beat poets? Do you think, what do you, what do you think when you do that? Do you have some inspiration? Well, again, growing up in San Francisco, um, Deanna and I attended the Spaghetti Factory, Hungry Eye, Hippo. These were all places, locations where you, particularly the Spaghetti Factory, where you'd hear poetry. I, I don't think I took it in much, but it's now seeping in after a, a long time. It's like finally getting to my soul. Um, but I was exposed to it, I, especially at the uh, Hungry Eye. We heard some wonderful singers and comedians that were ripping and ripping around. So it probably sunk in. But writing became a real mystery. You know, you know I graduated from high school. I did not want to go to college. Uh, I did not plan to go to college. Um, I worked in a Western Pipe and Engineering doing welding. Now I've covered in lead every night. And then I started drawing piping systems for power plants. But Deanna gave me this tablet, a leather tablet with a million empty pages. And she said, Ronnie, you should write about your failures. <laughs> failure as a camp <laughs> counselor, failure as a teacher teaching history. And that became the genesis of writing the Acorn People, the way which at the time, the Whole Earth Catalog began to publish. And then I sold them to the movie industry that would not have happened without that gift from a wife 
of a tablet. I mean, how did she know? How, how did she understand that that might change our life? That same story, the acorn people found its way to Janet Pomeroy. And I was losing all kinds of jobs, lost my job teaching history, lost my job at Stanford University because of women's rights, lost my job in a mental hospital. And I, I was feeling that I have some fundamental flaw. There's something wrong with me. But Dan had given that book to Janet Pomeroy and Janet Pomeroy thought I was sent by God. She was an evangelical woman and I arrived desperate for work. And she said, don't worry, Ron. And she pulled from her violet, her secretary's typewriter, <laughs> this piece of paper. It's a job description with my name on it. I mean, how did she know I'd be here waiting for a job? I'd only spoken to her for perhaps five minutes. And that was years ago. And yet that story propelled me to work for 30 years at the Janet Pomeroy Center. So you never know where life's gonna take you. Tell, tell us what Acorn People is about. The Acorn People, I, I was um, really young, 16, and Deanna's mother had MS. And in the back of my mind, I was thinking, okay, I had better become familiar with someone that is disabled. And I, it was a complete disaster. I hated it. It scared the hell out of me. People that couldn't eat, people falling over. But after a week or two weeks of time, I fell in love with these characters uh, and it was a blessing. So that's how that particular story came about. Wait, so the Acorn people, this is pre-Janet Pomeroy. Where were you with the disabled people? How did that happen? At that camp, Camp Harmon, when I was really young, it was the genesis for writing a book called The Acorn People. That's still in print today. So at Camp Harmon, you were a camp counselor? A terrible camp, camp counselor. You were terrible a terrible singer. <laughs> yeah. A camp counselor, and it was for disabled kids, is that correct? Yeah, and I had this I had a mate that was my you know helper, so to speak. He was Italian and um, a mafia character. And between the two of us and these great kids that were smoking and be misbehaving and chasing girls, it was like, okay, this is a phenomenal world. They became kings and it just, it just affected my heart. And, that, and Deanna knew that that had happened. So when she gave me that tablet, that was one of the stories that spilled out. It seems to me you're incredibly prolific and fast. How fast did you write that Acorn People book? Well, that's an interesting thing for the writers that might be listening tonight. I think when you get into a, it's music again, when you get into it, it, it comes very fast and you have to trust that. It's coming in ways you did not expect. The characters are changing right in front of you. You have to go with them. You can't, you can't strangle it. You've got to let it be free. And you know, Deanna and I are still writing. We, we just finished a book called The Vacant Lot a couple of weeks ago, which is about a racism in Missouri, a KKK and, and uh, racial prejudice and hangings. So Deanna and I are constantly doing books. We, we self-publish them. No one ever sees them. They go into the Amazon vacuum, but, but to do them, that's equally important. So if anyone's listening out there and you're a writer, you have to write and you have to self-publish. You have to get the work done. It might sit in your basement. I have a basement full of books. That's like Life in the Sunset. I sell that at Mills, but other than that, it's, it's in the basement. <laughs> I've got a lot of books in the basement. And you're just a font of stuff, a font of, of, of stuff. books that no one reads. <laughs> I think your daughter has made a comment. Oh she no. Says, Hillary says, Hi, Hi Dad. Dad. I'm watching from Houston. Bree is going to be 30. <laughs> She's answering my question. She knows I can't answer all these questions. Thanks, <laughs> Hillary. I am so blessed with Hillary and Digger. Uh, you know, your your children grow up and you, you look at them at some point and you go, my, good, good job. She was phenomenal as a child. She brought home so many strangers. And, and she always wanted to live in a multicultural world. She was well ahead of where I might be. And I'm blessed because of Hillary and her friends and Rihanna and Taylor. And how are you blessed because of her friends? What did, how did it open up your world? Well, you know, it, it's another world. 
I, I think she was really smart. She had her children go to St. John's, which was a parochial school here in the city. And of course, Deanna and I followed like lemmings. You know, Deanna became the school librarian. I became the CYO coach, so close to our kids. Um, but it was absolutely perfect because it was community. I, I'm really sad when I see the, the lack of sisters that, that inhabited these schools, that we don't have them any longer. And I think they really provided a, a, a wonderful learning environment actually. And I'm not Catholic, so it's, it's, it's strange to say all this, uh, but we became enamored with Sister Shirley, Sister Lillian, the community there, the families there that were Hispanic and from different cultures. Um, and they became fond friends. Wow. You wow. never know. I mean, I remember because my daughter was at Mercy High School when I think your grandchildren. Yeah, they I tried to get there? Audrey into Mercy. <laughs> were they, if they were still there or not? Yes, they were. Yeah, I, I, I think Taylor was for sure. And, and you just played a big role in Taylor's life and, 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 uh, went to all her games was she basketball player what was she yeah both girls were pretty athletic which was a, a great thing for us because we followed them into volleyball and basketball now brianna was extremely gifted she went on to become a division one volleyball player at a black historic school prairie view in houston amazing but then something really interesting happened she became associated with nike and I think Nike was promoting her to become one of their executives. She was interviewing people like Spike Lee or Dwight Howard. And I thought, oh my, I, I've lost her. I mean, I can't compete with that celebrity world. It, it's too exciting. It, but she came to me when, and I liked it because I got free Nike stuff. But, but <laughs> she came to me one day and said, Pape, no, I really want to do what you did. And, and both grandchildren volunteered at, as, as well as Hillary volunteered with me at the Janet Pomeroy Center. And I think we all became the benefactors of that world of, of differences. There's a lot of ways to win. And some, my best friend in the world, Michael Rice, that that's came out of the rec center. Did you explain to everyone what the Janet Pomeroy Center is? I'm not sure. Well, when I first started there, it was called the uh, Recreation Center for the Handicapped, RCH. Recreation Center for the Handicapped in San Francisco. Um, it was started by Janet Pomeroy and she had this vision that the disabled have a right to education and, and particularly recreation. Uh, and she was just so well ahead of her time. Um, and it was so wonderful just to work there. I mean, I, I got to work with seniors in the swimming pool. We, we would start operas and musicals. I got to work with Theater Unlimited, Theater Unlimited. We had a theater company there that we would meet every Thursday night for years. Sometimes a play would take that long to develop and other plays would come about spontaneously. We would do these huge plays with live bands and wild costuming. Uh, no one ever saw them, but we got to develop them and be a part of them. And Randy McCummins and this guy, David Levis were the primary directors. Um, they were wild, crazy men. Well, you're going to do kind of like the marsh, by the way, Stephanie. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Tell us how it's like the marsh. Well, you, you, the marsh is a legacy of all these voices. You know, where else would you see in this small little theater voices from the disabled, voices from the gay community, voices from the black community, voices from the health community, voices from all these different cultures find a place, a place to call home. And we get this chorus of humanity. I mean, the voices are powerful. We get women's voices. We get crazy voices, but they're all there for us to witness. I mean, I, I've sat in that dark space and just reveled. You know, things they happen. You got to be kidding me. I mean, I mean, amazing stuff. Exactly. Every day, Thank Diane Barnes stuff. Right now, you've got stuff happening that's powerful. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. And we're so glad that we get to do this and have all these things burble up like you and Diane and Dan and everybody and all the people we're meeting all over the world right now through Marsh Stream. Well, you've been very fortunate. I think David uh, Ford and Charlie Barron have been instrumental in teaching a lot of us how to become performers, how to find our voice. And you, you young lady are doing an opera. I am. 
And I think I'd like to see that with Dancer. Mm -hmm. With the Dancer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. You're letting the cat out of the bag, Mr. It's a, little, it's a teaser. It's a teaser. But since you're letting the cat out of the bag. No, no, it's just a little your, teaser. Your next cat. So you're going to do a piece about birds. Yeah, right? we could do that. Yeah. Oh, that's fun. Okay. So how did this piece come apart? Come I should back? tell you that Deanna and I have been living in 1201 Stanion Street for about the last 50 years. And behind our house is a lovely garden. It's like an oasis. It was a working nursery for years. It's, it's phenomenal. So this is a story. This is a true story about some birds that live in my backyard. I got birds. Mm -hmm. Living in my back, yeah, ba, 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 ba. birds living in my backyard. Birds, they, they, they love my backyard. They love to do loop de loops off those warm currents of air. Fly on top of my roof, kick gravel on my head. These birds eat those pyrocantha berries. Get very drunk, <laughs> smash into my window, <laughs> these birds. Well, 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 well. Everything was copacetic. That means fine. Until one day my neighbor, Mr. Arthur P. Anderson, placed upon his deck a blue pool of water. The bluebirds thought it was theirs. Every morning they lined up with a little blue goggles, a little blue inner tube. <laughs> And swing in their little blue pool of water. Brown birds thought to themselves, we like some water too. Perhaps if we did some brown bird praying, we would get some water. And that's just what they did. No water. Bluebirds became very arrogant and superior, <laughs> like bluebirds tend to get, and invited one of those brown birds <laughs> to come up and sing to them. She was a long legged brown bird. <laughs> Oh, those bluebirds were very excited. Hey, baby! <laughs> Take off those feathers! <laughs> Brown birds became very alarmed. Brothers and sisters, look over there. They got the water. And now they want our women folk. No more praying, brothers and sisters, but some flying. And some shitting. And that's just what they did. A spiral of brown birds high in the sky. And at just the right moment, lifted those little feathers and <laughs> shit all over those bluebirds. <laughs> those bluebirds, man. They found themselves the biggest bluebird they could find. <laughs> a mother of a bird. <laughs> Now the brown birds became very alarmed. Brothers and sisters, they got themselves a stealth fighter bomber bird. We, got... uh, we better find ourselves a big brown bird. And that's just what they did. Now these two big birds, they could no longer sing. They could no longer fly. But they were lifted high in the sky by their respective societies, where in the middle of the night they screeched at each other, <laughs> lost their balance, <laughs> stuck in the earth, beak first, feathers flying. Little brown birds and little blue birds got around. <laughs> Are we going to spend the rest of our lives watching brothers and sisters fall from these towers in the sky? Uh, along comes a red bird, 
a poet bird, a woman bird. When the red, red robin comes, ba, 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 ba. No more trouble when she starts singing that old oh, sweet song. Wake up, wake up, you sleepy heads. Get up, get up, get out of bed. Live, love, laugh, and be happy. I said she was a poet bird. She put those little feathers in the sky and she sang a song that those children had not heard before. Mother and child too tired to sleep. Freedom is the right to eat. Curbside saints of hearing voices, freedom is the right to choices. Briefcase soldiers going off to war again, they might too have a chance to get older. Child in the playground slowly swings. Freedom. Freedom is life's simplest things. And the little brown birds and little bluebirds got together. Don't you know, like Malcolm X said, Gandhi, Mandela, Dolores Huerta, made themselves a pool of water to go swimming in every morning, brown birds and bluebirds together, but most important of all, they learned about freedom. Freedom from fear, freedom from hate, freedom for everybody, don't you know? not just somebody. There is a moment, moment in time that comes to everyone this moment in time. It's not expected, something is wrong. Injustice right in front of you, what will you do? This moment that is here today, will you speak out loud or pray it away? This moment, the choice you must make for silence and fear, or risk that will take you to freedom, freedom. What will you do? There is a moment. Birds. <laughs> How wonderfully inventive you do that. And you end with that song, that moment in time song, right? From the Wave musical we did. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I think the Wave musical was the most wonderful possibility I ever experienced working with others. I mean, we had David Denny, we had that crazy gal, Kathy Peck, we had you, we had the phenomenal direction, we had, it was a combined effort culminating in this beautiful play and musical that I, it's the best experience I've ever, e will ever have, ever. So, I mean, the, the wave is constantly be, being done theatrically around the world. So I see versions of it in, in Hong Kong, uh, New Delhi, Berlin, Jerusalem. Nothing compares to Marsh Youth Theater version of the wave musical, nothing, nothing. It was amazing, but tell everybody who might not know the, the background of that. Well, I, I don't know. What do you think the background was? I, it, it, well, you it's all, I think it's you opening your door saying, why don't you do this? I mean, the Marsh Youth Theater was something that I kind of volunteered with for years and have a great affinity for. Um, so we knew we had some young performers and we knew because of you, we would have people that had directorial skill, musical skill, so it's, it was a great combination. And we had the belief that we could do it. That's the strangest thing of all. Now that I look back on it, I, I am witnessing other very professional musicians in New York trying to do this as a musical. And I've been back to New York to see some of their efforts, not even close. Well, but so the wave comes from the experiment you did at the Palo Alto High School. Right, right. Yeah. What, just, just bring, you know, real quickly bring our audience up to speed? Well, it was a classroom experiment in um, what is the appeal of fascism. I thought it would be one day I would introduce discipline. But when I returned to class the subsequent Tuesday, the students were all sitting in attention with these zipper-like smiles. So improvisationally, spontaneously, I began to construct what are the elements of fascism? I started talking about and exploring what is community, 
membership cards, chants, placards. What is action? So we were evolving into this cult and I became a victim of my own design because I, I liked it. I liked the order. I liked the discipline. I liked the fact that those students that were usually in the middle of the class that are fairly invisible to a teacher suddenly are activated. Uh, it, was, it was intriguing. But how to get out of it was the bigger mystery. Two women in the class objected. And this is important. Where does objection come from? It came from women. And my wife in particular said, I don't like who you're becoming, Ron. You're, you've lost your playfulness. You've lost your curiosity. Um, I don't like this. And with that insight, I quickly figured out how to bring it to a close with an introduction that there would be a big lie. There would be a new leader. And that leader was Adolf Hitler. So the wave existed. We kept it a secret for about 10 years. And then when it exploded into, because of the whole earth catalog again, um, became public knowledge. And, and now it's a worldwide cautionary story. So I guess what happened was, so you were a high school teacher, you, you were studying the Holocaust. Right. Some students say, said, how could it ever happen if I remember correctly? And you, you started this experiment, which you then, I guess, felt embarrassed about and didn't tell anybody. But then you wrote a short article for Whole Earth Catalog. Is that correct? Right, exactly. And then when that happened, what happened wrong? Oh, well, Norman Lear wanted it, but Norman Lear considered it to be public property, which means I would get nothing as the creative artist behind the original story. So once again, the Whole Earth Catalog, Stuart Brand, gave me this story for one dollar and, and that allowed me to give it to other theater companies or have control over where the story is going which i still have and by the way again stephanie you premiered a documentary about this called the invisible line at the marsh before anyone else in the world it premiered at the marsh, marsh. and it was wonderful and we hope we can bring it back that was one we can't keep it in our archives because our our documentary film friend is needs it to sell it to things like the history channel but what a documentary but then but the, so the thing was you did this and then you kind of let go of it and then about what 20 30 years later you decided to work on this musical at the marsh which is the first production of the wave you ever worked on right yeah that's very true and it had a lot of poetry i had done a lot of writing that no one had access to so a lot of the dialogue for the songs was the, from that, those diaries. So it was pretty unique. There is a moment as, as an example of that. There is a moment, a moment in time. Such a beautiful song. Yeah. Such a beautiful song. Um, and that was such a wonderful experience for the Marsh. Now getting back to the birds thing. So this is, you know, you've, you're using these birds, but I really need to know, Ron, did those, was it brown birds with <laughs> poop on the bluebirds? Yes. <laughs> no, that's 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 fabrication. Oh, darn, darn. They were fighting over the water, but I, I think I added the shit. <laughs> <laughs> and and why is this? And the red birds of fabrication, but I think women are the voice of the future. So, gotta throw that there. And so what made you work on this piece? Birds? Yeah. Oh, well, I, I saw that what was happening and was right in my backyard. I thought, well, I should write about this. I mean, they're, they're, they're not people, but they're definitely going through this drama of life. And they have a message for us. I, I, sit, I sit in the backyard a lot looking at trees and, pl and plants. Um, and I think there's a lot of messages out there waiting for us to find. You can't sit around. You you are doing so much. You are doing so writing. How do, how do you plan your day out? What's your day like? Deanna and I wake up, smooch, smooch, <laughs> have coffee, breakfast, sit on the back deck just together, especially if it's sunny, and just sit and talk. Um, sometimes with our neighbor who's next door, uh, Chris and Ted. Um, Sometimes we plan trips, um, driving trips, to get a crab sandwich down at the wharf, or go down to Barbara's Fish Shack down in, you know, Princeton. 
um, we, we just enjoy being together and sharing stuff. She is a great organizer. You don't understand this. I can't fix anything. I couldn't even find us probably on the internet. Deanna can fix anything, can do anything. She can lay out books. She organizes her therapeutic swimming group into a newsletter. She organizes events for them. She is the real community organizer. I'm the writer. Writing is easy. Community organizing, a little harder. And that's who she is. Well, when do you, you weren't writing in any of those scenarios you just presented to me. When do you write? Well, I'm, I'm very lucky. I am currently taking uh, two writing groups. I work with the FROM. I go to FROM. FROM was for seniors up at USF. Wonderful classes, but it's closed because of the pandemic. But one of the women, Judy Schulman, organizes us, and we write about every two weeks. We send our works to Judy. She prints it, and we read our works as a collective. And we, perf we were performing at the FROM on a regular basis. The second group I belong to is Charlie Varon. Well, of course, David Ford's Club Solo with that crazy group, Beth McLaughlin. You know, come on, some great writers, that group. But I also work with Charlie Varon and his group. And he does a Zoom class every Monday. And I write in that class every Monday. Because Charlie always gives us a, a photograph and then some writing assignments. And it's just like music. It forces us out of our normal lockstep of writing into some, finding some new avenues some new approaches, very valuable, and phenomenal, phenomenal writers in all of these groups. I mean, you've got Mark McGoldrick, for instance, in Club Solo. You've got Wayne Harris in Club Solo. You've got Bruce Packman. You've got, you've got talent. Um, so I'm, I'm blessed to be around that. So we were talking about two different things. So Club Solo, tell us a little bit about that. How long has that been going on? How did that get started? Club Solo has been going on for 135 years. It was started by a guy <laughs> called Club Solo in no, probably about 20 years. Very spontaneous, the desire just to be together and share each other's work and help each other develop that work. It, it's a place where you can experiment with things. So Wayne, for instance, will bring in a new song or a new scenario and we'll all look, listen to it and then evaluate it and maybe comment on it. Mark, in his preparation for your show, uh, shared with us how to use the Zoom. And we all were helping him about how to <laughs> have fun. That's right. We can't wait to see more of Mark's show, Mark McGoldrick. Yeah, um, it's, it's great. So, and then um, I think you've got some, a piece. Yeah, I've, I've got a piece from, from Charlie's class. It's really short, but it will give you some insight into my mother. So in Charlie's class, what happens is he gives you a photograph and you write for about one minute based on that photograph. And then he'll insert another prompt that's totally different. It might be a list of friends or a list of time. Then you use that to spin and write continuous. So this is that Charlie Varon prompt was a photograph of a dark building and this is what came out of that, writing-wise. Escape. But where? We're all in our places with somber, dead faces. Who can, who can I call for help? I mean, boom, boom, in a great to be crazy. Boom, boom, in a great to be crazy. Horsey and a flea in a three. Mom, 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 where are you when I need you? Always singing on Sunday drives in the Packard. Doug always making sandwiches for the drive. Horsey and a flea and a three blind mice sitting in a corner shooting dice. Horsey slipped and fell on the oops of the flea. There's a horsey on me. Boom, boom, in a great. Where are we going? Mom, it doesn't matter. We are together riding white horses. Now Charlie inserts a, a prompt to list three places and then write about one of them. Escape, 46th Avenue, the Sunset District, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. My brother, Doug and I in the bedroom, listening to the radio, hop along Cassidy wallpaper, a books of comic books, a box of comic books under the bed. Al Jasbo Collins from the Purple Grotto, KSFO in San Francisco, a street lamp, grandma mistakenly blessed as an ever-present full moon. 
TC on his trombone playing T for two. Ba ba z, ba 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 ba. Mom in the kitchen painted canary yellow. Okay, the painting of the kitchen was supposed to be a surprise. Canary yellow. Uh, the paint was uh, thick in the gallon can and came onto the paintbrush in lumps. With a roller, I could reach behind the stove. Uh, no one will notice my short reach or the cabinets being painted shut. I need more paint, a lot more paint. It's like glue dripping from the ceiling. The floor is easy to mop back to its linoleum brown. Droplets on the refrigerator provide a streak of genius. Why not? Why not, I ask you, paint the refrigerator, canary yellow? And the back porch, the breakfast nook, the stove. Mom, it was supposed to be a surprise. You and TC and Doug were going to Disneyland. You let me stay home alone being teen responsible. So yeah, it would be a great date. I'll, I'll get Deanna. I mean, we are going steady. Uh, she can help me paint and then we can just go make out. She actually knew something about paint, how you have to mix it and have towels to pick up the runaway drops, not to paint the light fixtures. Mom, I thought you'd love this surprise. The red bow on the canary yellow faucet. You didn't say a word on revealing your surprise. I mean, you just went to your bedroom and closed the door and Doug ran to our bedroom and got under the blankets and TC couldn't stop laughing. In one week, mom, you sold the house with the yellow kitchen. Never spoke about the surprise, but always, always greeted each unknown or fear with the song. Down by the meadow, by the itty bitty poo, wham, three little fishies and the mama fishy too. Swim, said the mama fishy. Swim if you can. And they swam and they swam all over the dam. Ba -ba -ba boom, boom, did them, dad, why don't you? Boom, boom, did them, dad, why don't you? And they swam and they swam all over the dam. So that's typical writing assignment done every week. <laughs> so Ron, you do it in the class and then did, is that exactly what you wrote or did you then take it and work on it? Oh no, no, the, I don't, I usually let it be as it is as opposed to reworking it. And the beauty of the class is you get to hear what other people have written given the very same prompts. And again, they're, they far exceed anything I've ever thought about. They're always unique. Yeah, wow, that's great. That yellow kitchen, I have a yellow kitchen. <laughs> oh, it was terrible. It... <laughs> Do you have a photo of that yellow kitchen? No, <laughs> do not. Well, I'd, I'd like to thank everyone who showed up. I mean, you are the reason we do these things. Um, without you, there is no show. So you're very, very important. And I hope you think about maybe writing yourself or performing yourself and think about improvising. I, I notice I'm emailing a lot of my nephews here. <laughs> Well, Ron, thank you so much. As always, you are amazing. What do you My mean? My joy, Stephanie. It's always a joy. You've been so supportive to me and the Marsh. You even wrote in when they didn't give my child a, 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 a role in your <laughs> show. You wrote a role for her so she could have a role. I maybe, mean, the, maybe that's the secret. Everyone has a role in life. You just have to find it and, and honor it. Yes, and you wrote a role, amazing. So thank you, thank you.